Let's come and worship God. His word says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's stand and sing our first hymn, number 784, Psalm 121. Unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes, 784. Unto the hills around do I lift up my longing eyes. Oh, whence for me shall my salvation come? From whence arise? From God the Lord doth come my certain aid. From God the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. He will not suffer that thy foot be moved, save shall thou be. O careless slumber shall his eyelids close, who keepeth thee. Behold our God, the Lord is tumbled now, who keepeth his rail in his holy care. He over is himself the keeper true, thy changeless shades. Jehovah, thy defense on thy right hands himself hath made. And the no sun shall ever, ever smite, no moon shall harm thee in the silent night. From every soul from every sin. Jehovah shall preserve thy going out, thy coming in. Above the watching, him whom we adore, the hands for then forevermore. Let us pray. O oh, great God in heaven, we often look for help in so many different ways. We need help, O oh Lord. We need help in everything. O oh Lord, we can look with our eyes to the hills, to the horizon, and wonder where our help will come from. But we thank you that our help comes from you, the Lord, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who spoke and this world came into being. You are the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. We thank you, O oh Lord, that you made this world and everything on it. You made all things. The Lord Jesus has made all things. All things were made through him and for him, for his pleasure, for his glory. We praise you that the Holy Spirit moved and hovered on the waters and everything was made by you. And you look back over those Six days at the end of it, and you saw that all that you had made, and it was very good. We praise you that the one who made the world, the one who has the power to speak and to 
have this universe with all its complexity and diversity and unity to come into being. It is nothing for you to help us. It is nothing for you, our God, to strengthen us. Lord, you are the great God. We can look around and see the beauty of your creation and know that it is nothing, O oh Lord, for you to come and aid us. And we pray that you would aid us. We come this morning maybe with trials in our lives, maybe with problems, maybe with difficulties that we wouldn't really even share with others. But Lord, we thank you that we have a place to turn to. We have a God to pray to. And we come to you, the never-failing God. We have all of those wonderful, great and precious promises, those exceedingly great and precious promises in your word that you will not allow our foot to be moved. Lord, we thank you that you will never permit the righteous to be moved. Thank you, Lord, that ultimately you keep us in your embrace and in your fatherly care. We praise you that you who keep us, you do not sleep, O oh God. You do not blink. You do not miss anything. You do not take 40 winks. We thank you that you do not go on holiday. You do not check out. We thank you that you who keep Israel, your people, shall neither slumber nor sleep. We praise you that you are our keeper. You are our watchman. You look out for our soul. You are our guide and you are our guard. We thank you that you are our shield and our shade and that you are our shade at our right hand. And just when the sun comes down and we put up a shade to shade us from its rays, oh God, you are that shade for us. May you cause us not to look for others to protect us, but ultimately to look to you. May we not look within ourselves, but to look to you, the living and the eternal God. And Father, we thank you that the sun shall not strike us as it were by day, nor the moon by night with those chill blades. But, O oh Lord, we praise you that you protect your people. You hide us in your pavilion. We thank you that you preserve us, O oh God, from all evil. And throughout our lives, you preserve our souls, that never dying part of us. And we thank you that in our lives, as we go out and as we come in, and although we might not even be conscious of it, we thank you for your keeping power. Lord, you've kept us for many, many days, many months, many years, and maybe even many decades. Lord, you have been our keeper. You have been the one who has helped us and guided us. Lord, you're wonderful in counsel and you are excellent in guidance. We worship you. Oh, Father, we do pray for you today to be the one that we look to. May this be a joyful and may this be a glorious time today on your day, this morning, and again this evening as we gather together on the first day of the week, on the day that you have appointed for us to gather, the day that the Lord Jesus rose from the dead, and we ask that we would be in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that we would be those, O oh God, who truly want to meet with you, that we want to have you speak to us, Lord, may not one soul leave this place unmoved and untouched by you speaking to us from your word. Forgive us of our indifference. Forgive us of our hard-heartedness that many times we turn away and, and don't remember and, and don't take on board those things that you say, like looking into the mirror and forgetting our appearance. Lord, may we not just be hearers of your word, but may we be doers also. May we be those people who apply the truths of you in your word to our lives. May we be those who have an ear to listen and to obey what you would have to say. May today be a good day. May you feed our souls. May you be near us because we pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let's open our Bibles and we turn to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. We'll read the whole of this chapter. It's on page 62, running into page 63 in our church Bible. It's Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, beginning to read at verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before Pi Harioth, between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Ziphon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now we're told the king of Egypt that the people have fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have we done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pi Harioth, before Baal Ziphon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you done so dealt with why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen, then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. So it was between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. 
And he troubled the army of the Egyptians and he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea when the morning appeared. The sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel have walked on dry land in the midst of the sea and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw that the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Our second hymn is number 568. 568, will your anchor hold in the storms of life. 568. Will your anchor hold in the storm? Will the storm lose drift and the table strain? Will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps us all steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep. In the Savior's love, streets of fear when the breakers roll and the reef is near, while the surges rage and the wild winds blow, shall the anchor waves broke your floor. Steadfast and sure as the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Will your anchor hold in the floods of death when the waters cold chill your latest breath on the rising tide? You can never fail while your anchor holds within the fail. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Anchor hold through the morning light The city of God and the harbour bright Will your anchor save by the heavenly shore When lies the past forevermore We have an anchor that keeps the soul Steadfast and sure as the pillars roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Saviour's love. Well, we're a bit depleted, aren't we, for children, but we're still back on. And we're looking at these wonderful Bible stories, and we're looking at Abraham, this wonderful man of God, and God promised Abraham a 
child, through Sarah, his wife. It wouldn't come through any other means, but through his wife, Sarah. But there was a problem. What was the problem? What was the problem? Were they young or were they old? They were old. They were past the child, Sarah, past the age of childbearing. But God promised a son because with God, nothing is impossible. Do you know, it says that a few, good few times in the Bible that there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And if the Lord wants Sarah to have a child, he will make sure that Sarah will have a child. And the Lord keeps his promise and, and there's more and more of promises about what this child is going to be and when it's going to happen. And there was the angel of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, who told Abraham there's going to be a child by Sarah this time next year and Sarah's in the tent and there's always someone earwigging, isn't there? There's always someone earwigging and listening into conversations. And that was Sarah, and she laughed. And the Lord said, Why did you laugh? And she said, No, but I didn't laugh. He said, But you did laugh. And sure enough, the Lord was right. And there was a child that was born to Sarah. And the Lord told Abraham to call it Isaac. And that's exactly what that child was called. This is how it's recorded in Genesis. 21 verse 1. And the Lord visited Sarah as he said. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. Because God always keeps his promises. He never fails. We don't. We often fail. Do, do you ever get promised things? And people say, with the best intention of the world, I'm going to do this for you. And they don't. We get let down. We let others down, don't we? But God never lets us down. And whatever God promises, he always, always performs his promise. Always. He said that there would be a child. He said when it would be. And sure enough, there was a child. And they called him Isaac. Does anyone know what Isaac means? Anybody know? It means laughter. Because Abraham laughed when he was told, and Sarah laughed when she was told, and this was laughter. Child in the old age. Who would have thought it? Abraham was 100. Sarah was 90 years old. How many 90-year-olds do you see having children? None, do you? It's a work of God, this promised child with a miraculous birth. And what does it do? It points forward to something even greater and a promised child who's even better than Isaac. And it born even more miraculously than Isaac. Who does it point forward to? The Lord Jesus. Because he's the promised child and he was born incredibly. And he wasn't born like us. He was an amazing child. And he was the promised saviour for sinners. The Lord Jesus. So we're to look at Isaac and we're to see the Lord Jesus. Just like when you look at a picture of a person and you remember that person. We're to look at Isaac as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you always keep your promises. We're sad, Lord, that we don't always keep ours. And we pray for your forgiveness. But we thank you that you're a promise-keeping God. You make them and you keep them. And you were always a promise-maker. You were never a promise-breaker. And Father, we pray that we'll claim your promises that you've given to us in your word. We thank you that you promised throughout the Old Testament, giving us more and more information about the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that he came into the world to save sinners. And we pray that we would trust in Christ. And we thank you for all these pictures that are in your word that tell us about the Lord Jesus. Thank you that Isaac is a picture of Christ, that wonderful saviour. And we pray that we would be trusting in the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your servants who preach your word. And we especially pray for Giles this morning, uh, Bethel Armley. We thank you for that fellowship, Lord. Thank you for what you've done there. When it was due to close, they had set a date for closure. 
And yet you miraculously turned that work around. You did that, Lord. We say thank you. You are God. And there they are, still open today. And we pray for them. And we ask for Giles as he preaches your word there this morning. Help him. We know that there, that there is a congregation made up of lots of different nationalities and, and different people groups. And, and Giles was saying in the week that he's struggling to know how to pitch it. Lord, we pray that you would give him the right words to say. That you give him the right way to say it. Lord, still his fears and may he be trusting in you this morning. Pray that you would be near to him. Thank you for him and, and the family and pray for them as they're over a Bethel armly. Thank you for what we heard from Caring for Life last Wednesday. We pray for that organization. We thank you for them meeting needs. We thank you for caring for the vulnerable, for those, O oh Lord, who have not had the advantages that we have had in life. Some of those horrific stories that we heard on Wednesday. And we thank you that you gave Peter Parkinson that vision and Esther Smith years ago to help those people. And we thank you. We praise you from our hearts that they're still going forward. We pray for everyone who works there. We pray for every soul that they reach. Lord, these are people. They're real lives. And we pray that their work would go from strength to strength in your strength as they meet various needs of people. Pray, Lord, for those who come to know the Lord Jesus through that work. Keep them. Help them. Be with them. For those in, in difficult situations and environments, we ask that you would cause them to be faithful. Lord, be near to that work. Help those that are running it to make those wise decisions. And we pray that they would know your peace and joy as they seek to do what they can to reach others for Christ. And help us to say, Lord, what can we do for you? Help us to give our lives to you in the cause of Jesus. We pray that you would be with us as we preach your word this morning. We ask that you would speak to every one of us as we think through what your word has to say to us. We pray that you would empower preacher and hearer because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the preaching, let's sing the hymn 831. 831. The battle is the Lord's. The harvest fields are white. 831. fields are white how few the reaping hearts appear the strength how slight yet victory is secure we face a vanquished foe what did the risen Christ to battle go is the Lord's, not ours is strength or skill, but his alone is sovereign grace to work his will. Hearts counting not the cost, unflinching to obey, and in his time his holy shall win the day is the Lord's the bitter crucified must with the travel of his soul his heart is fight now fail and all God's works be done Till every soul whom he has given to Christ be one. <clears throat> then still my soul and view 
the great salvation God has wrought, reveal to you. Then rest. I'm sure that we've all seen amazing and astonishing sights, haven't we? Really astounding scenes, things that have taken our breath away. We maybe have seen a beautiful sunset and we've said to the person or people that have been with us, look at that amazing sight. Maybe not while you're driving, <laughs> keeping our eyes on the road. I mean, imagine seeing the Grand Canyon. I've only ever seen pictures of it, photographs of it, but have you ever been there? What must it be like to be at the Grand Canyon and to see that spectacular sight? And there are the many, many other spectacular views that we can see. But however good those views are, and I'm sure that they are amazing views, I'm sure that they're not like this scene that we read about and that we're going to think through this morning. And that is the Red Sea opening up. Have you ever seen the sea divide? Now, for the first two and a half decades of my life, I grew up by the sea. In fact, I've lived more by the sea than I haven't lived by the sea, if that makes sense. And I perhaps have seen the sea more than most. And, and the many, many times when I've gone to the beach, and the many times when I used to get my thinking done by the, by the sea, and you walk by the sea and hear the, the, the waves, privilege to grow up by the sea. I never once saw that sea open up. Never once. The other day, of us as a family, we decided to go to Whitby, great day out is, is Whitby and all the day long the children are there on the beach having a whale of a time and all day long we saw the tide come in and when we were leaving we saw the tide go out but we never saw the sea opening up a spectacular, amazing incredible sight but it happened in the Red Sea all those years ago the sea opened up, an amazing work and only God could do that, couldn't he? We can't do that. We can't command the sea to open up. If you were to drive to, to Whitby or the nearest beach and you were to say, sea open up, it wouldn't take a blind bit of notice. But the Lord does. And we're going to see this incredible event, no doubt familiar to many of us. And we're going to see it in Hebrews as we continue. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 29 is where we've got up to. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, where it says, By faith they, that's the children of Israel, passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Now, how are we going to look at this event? Because this is the faith of the children of Israel seen in the parting of the Red Sea. And we're going to look at it as the writer explains it. Now, how does the writer of the Hebrews tell us about this event? Well, he looks at it from two angles. There's a contrast that's been established and set up here, isn't there? There's a big antithesis between the children of Israel and the Egyptians. So we see, by faith they, children of Israel, pass through the Red Sea. So we need to look at it from the Israelite perspective and then we're going to see it from the Egyptian perspective because when the Egyptians attempted to do so they were drowned so first of all and this will probably be the longest we're going to be looking at it from the Israelite perspective what did the Red Sea mean for them by faith they passed through the Red Sea because we can look at the same event in different angles and in different ways, can't we? It's one of the wonderful things about the Bible is you can see it like a diamond. If you ever look at a diamond, you can look at it at different angles. It's got so many different facets to it. You can look at it from one angle and you can turn it around and you can look at it from another angle and you can look at these amazing stories, narratives you can call them, events, history in the Bible and you can look at it through various different angles 
angles. And that's what we're going to do through two angles. So first of all, there is the Israelite angle. And the key word that we need here is faith. Because they had faith. And then later on, we'll look at the Egyptians. And the key word there is failure. Failure. Faith and failure. So firstly, there's faith as we look at it through Israelite eyes. Because it says, by faith. This is the chapter of faith, isn't it? And now this is the faith, not of an individual, not of one person. We've been looking at the faith of Moses. And we've been seeing what wonderful faith he exhibited. But actually, this is more of a corporate faith, isn't it? Because it says, by faith they. It doesn't say, by faith he. It doesn't say, faith by any one individual. It doesn't name them, does it? It says, they, the children of Israel, had faith faith to pass through the Red Sea. They got out of Egypt. Some background. How did they get into Egypt in the first place? We've been looking at it in our previous studies as it's overlapped with the different characters that we've been analysing and looking and, and challenging ourselves over about faith. And they got into the children of Israel into Egypt by that man called Joseph. And he had a real up and he had a real down of a life, didn't he? We might say. I'm sure that he was confused many times in his life as he was carted off as a youngster from his home environment, from the culture that he had known, from the family, that, particularly his father, who loved him. And he was placed into this pagan environment. He's put into prison for something he didn't do, but yet the Lord was with Joseph. Isn't that an encouraging verse? And the Lord is with us as his people. Whatever the circumstances of our lives, the ups, the downs, the tears of sorrow, the tears of joy, the Lord has promised to be with us. Lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never leaves us in the lurch. He's always with us. Take encouragement. And even when we can't understand the Lord's purposes to us, and why we can't understand all the things that come upon us, we can draw this confidence that it's for our good. It's like looking at a machine. And when you see a machine, you might not understand all the parts and how this part relates to that part and everything else and, and all the minutely details of the machine, but you know what the end product produces. And so it is with the purposes of God. All things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And it did. And if Joseph was there in the prison thinking, well, what's going on here? The Lord had a plan for his life. And the Lord has plans for our lives. He was going to save a nation and his family from starvation. And he's a huge picture. is Joseph of Jesus because he saves us, the Lord Jesus, rejected by his family, rejected by his own. But he came. And that's how the children of Israel came to live in Egypt when his family, Jacob, came to settle there. But things change. There was a Pharaoh who came, who arose, who did not know Joseph. And he was worried because power corrupts us and we're always worried. What happens if we'll be usurped? What happens if someone takes my place? And that's what ungodly people do when they don't trust in God. They're worried. They've got the EBGBs. What's going on with these Israelites? What happens if they join forces in battle? Right, we're going to put them in slavery. We're going to crush their spirit. We don't want them to increase in their population. So this Pharaoh sets taskmasters over them. And the children of Israel, in bitter bondage, they did what we should do. They cried out to God. They prayed to the Lord. And the Lord remembered, not that he'd forgotten, but he remembered, he deliberately focused in upon the covenant that he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And he established a leader called Moses. And Moses and Aaron, he, they went to Pharaoh with God, having caused Moses to grow up so he knew all the customs of the Egyptians, knew how he could gain an audience with Pharaoh. And he said... Let my people go. Now Moses wasn't coming with a word from himself. He didn't come and say, listen, this is what I'm saying to you. I'm saying, let the Israelites go. That's not what Moses did, was it? He said, this is what the Lord has said. He's a conduit. He's a servant. He's a messenger of the Lord. And he says, the Lord has said, let my people go. And what did Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I don't know the Lord. No, I'll let his people go. Which is the response of the vast majority of people to the Christian gospel. Who is the Lord? Don't want to know him. Don't want to obey him. But it's the word of the Lord. 
and Pharaoh harden his heart. Now, when people come and they speak to us and they do it from the Bible, they're the Lord's servant and the Lord speaks to them through his word. And it's them speaking, of course, but it's the Lord speaking through them. And when we reject it, and when we say, nah, I don't want to know, it's not them we're rejecting ultimately. It's the Lord that we're rejecting. It's his word. And, and the servant is always doing, seeking to explain God's word. Don't be a pharaoh. Hard heart, stony heart. Again, the children, they picked up some stones the other day from the beach. Look at these stones in their heart. Is that like your heart? Because that was Pharaoh's heart. The Bible says, as it quotes from the Old Testament in Hebrews 3, 7, it says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If King Charles wrote to you and said, do this, you would do it. The King of Kings speaks to us and we've got to say, Lord, I'm going to obey. Don't turn your face away from the Lord. It's a serious issue. Look where it got fairer. Look where it ended up. So the Lord said, right, okay, it's not going to listen, plagues. And the Lord was kind. He, they grew in intensity. They grew, didn't they, in severity. And he started off by turning the blood, the Nile into blood, that water into blood. And he, he targeted the Egyptians. Because why did the Lord send the plagues? He sent the plagues to say, I am God, not your gods of the Egyptians. And so he hit them on the gods they worship. They worship the Nile. They worship the, the moon. They worship the animals. They worship all sorts of things. And the last plague was the death of the firstborn that we saw last week. They were to get that lamb, kill it without blemish. That lamb was killed. Blood was spilled. They put the blood on the doorpost. And it points forward to the blood of the Lord Jesus because Christ is our Passover. It talks about the Lord Jesus Christ's blood are you washed in the blood of Christ? You may have seen, you just have to walk through Thornhill and you'll see it. I saw one house the other day and it had it up almost in every window, these flags that have got a red cross. Have you seen it? You see it in carts, you see it on houses, you see it all over the place, don't we? Do you know what it's about? Do you know where that came from? It's our flag, isn't it? Where was it? Cross, what does it speak of? The cross of Christ. What colour is it? Red. Why is it red? Blood. There's the blood on the cross. There's the blood on the cross. It's all over the place, isn't it? And if only we could just grasp that meaning of the blood on the cross and have our sins washed clean by the Lord Jesus Christ's blood. Are you washed clean by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Christ, our Passover lamb. And finally, with Pharaoh's firstborn dead, and all of the Egyptians firstborn dead, in the middle of the night, he called Moses and Aaron and said, you can go. Before there was compromise, well, just send out certain people, or just go out without the animals, or you can go and then change his mind. Now he says, just go. They'll all die, is what, he's, was what they meant. And off they went. You imagine the joy of the children of Israel being told... They can go, being liberated. What a joyful thing that must have been. Being enslaved, having whips across their back, being put to, to hard tasks. They can leave, they can be liberated. And it's a big picture of, of the gospel of Jesus. Because just as the children of Israel were enslaved, we are enslaved. You may say, I'm not enslaved. I haven't got a ball and chain around me, me ankle. I haven't got handcuffs around me, around, me, around me wrists. But Jesus said, he who sins is a slave of sin. Do you know, every time we sin, we're putting a handcuffs on us spiritually. We're putting a ball and chain around our ankle spiritually. We're enchaining ourselves. We're putting ourselves in a spiritual prison. It's no, there's no future. There's no direction in sin at all. But the same person who said, he who sins is a slave of sin, said this, if the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. You imagine being a part of the Second World War and being in that concentration camp and being told, you can leave. You imagine it. Being in horrendous conditions. And then you can go. Well, there's even more liberation. There's even bigger freedom. Eternal freedom. In Jesus Christ, by what Jesus Christ did at the cross of Calvary. Have you, are you free? People say, oh, Christianity. You know what it is? It's a set of rules and regulations. Do this, do that. Sunday's not fun day. All of this stuff. It's all, but it's not. It's liberating. Jesus makes us free. 
He sets us free. Are you free? Just as the children of Israel were free from that hard bondage, we are free from sin. And freedom is wonderful in Christ. What joy they must have had. But that joy turned into sorrow when they went out into the wilderness, into the place that God had told them, and there they were, and they weren't disobedient. They were at the very place that God had told them to go, and they looked up. Can you imagine the horror in their faces and in their hearts when they saw the Egyptians coming toward them? Because the Egyptians pursued them. They're coming either to recover us as slaves or destroy us. The Red Sea is in front of them. They can't go behind. They can't go to the left, the mountainous region. They'd be caught. What do we do? We can't fight. We can't run. We can't flee. What are we going to do? Have you ever been like that? You know, there are some trials that come up on us and we don't know where they've come from and they just come up to us. But there are other problems that you can see it coming and when it comes, you can say, I could see that coming. Do you ever have that? And we look up and we see the problems on the horizon coming our way. We haven't got to go out of our way to look for problems in life. They come to us sure enough, don't they? We never go through life problem free. We have huge problems and trials and difficulties. And we've got to face those difficulties in life. And they look up and they see all of these problems. They see the Egyptians coming. What are we going to do? They pray, well that's a good thing, but they also moan, which is not a good thing. And they're running around like headless chickens, these, these thousands of Israelites. They're not trained in battle. They haven't got any weapons compared to the Egyptians. The Egyptians can outmaneuver them. They can outsmart them. Humanly speaking, they haven't got a chance. What's going to happen? Better off back in Egypt, aren't we? And Moses, this is a huge test for him, spiritually, what's he going to do? And he proves himself godly. Because what he does is he gets them to stop looking at the problems. You're seeing the Egyptians coming, but to see the salvation of the Lord. You see, they looked up, they lifted up their eyes, and they saw the Egyptians. But Moses says this, don't do that. See the salvation of the Lord. You need faith. When I was growing up in Broadstairs, there was this older couple, and they were called Tony and Margaret, Elliot. And Tony lost his job many years before. They're relating the story. And he came home. Imagine losing your job. Young man. Young family. As far as I know. Came home. Sat down. And he said, I don't know what we're going to do, Margaret. I don't know what we're going to do. And you know what Margaret said? She said, where's your faith, Tony? Where's your faith? And that's what we need to be told many times, isn't it? Where's your faith? In the problems of life, where's our faith? We need faith in the Lord. This was a providential problem. It wasn't because of their disobedience. They were right in the place where the Lord wanted them. They didn't invent the Red Sea in front of them and the pursuing Egyptians behind them. And sometimes when we get into problems and we get into difficulties, the natural reaction to think of is, I've done something wrong. Now it might be the case, but not often. And it's not the case that when we're in the way of the Lord's will, we're going to have problem-free life. We've got to get that thinking right out of our brains. That's not biblical and it's not helpful. Because we can unduly beat ourselves up, can't we? When the Lord Jesus said to the disciples, get in that boat over the Sea of Galilee, and there was that massive storm that they were worried about, it wasn't the disciples' fault they were obeying Jesus to go into the storm. It wasn't the Israelites' fault they were obeying God where the Lord had told them to go to. They didn't invent this problem. It wasn't because of their disobedience here. Now, it might be that we have problems because of our disobedience, but it isn't often. Often it's the Lord sends us to test our faith. These problems, not to be nasty, but to say, where is our real reliance? Where is our real trust? Who are we actually trusting in? And Moses is so right. And notice the order. He doesn't say, first of all, in Exodus 14, right, go forward. No, he puts them in a position where they can actually hear those words. He says, first of all, do not be afraid. How many times in the Bible do we have that? Do not fear. Fear not. Why does it say it so many times in the Bible? Who's the Bible for? It's for us. 
Why does he say so many times, do not fear? Because we are fearful. We're fretful. We're just like the children of Israel. How we love the word of God. It's the mirror that shows us what we're like. And what we're like is we run around like headless chickens. It doesn't take a lot, does it? To make us afraid. And we first of all need to calm down. Do not fear. Do not fear, he says. And then he says, stand still. You're fretting. Do not fear. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And it's when they did that that the Lord then said, go forward. And that's the order that he has for us today. He tells us, do not be afraid. He tells us that we're to stand still. And then we're to see the salvation of the Lord. And then we're to go forward. He doesn't tell us to go forward while we're fretful. Not normally. He says, no, no, no. You need to get into a right position first. That's what you're to do. And to see this wonderful thing that the Lord's going to do. And then you're to go forward. And the Lord told Moses to stretch out his hand over the sea and to the amazement of the children of Israel. And this event would be huge. It would send shockwaves among the other nations because when Rahab, years later, was speaking to the spies, she said, oh, your God is the one who opened up the Red Sea. They'd heard about it. Many nations around had heard, oh yeah, that's the God who does incredible things. Amazing things. Opens up the Red Sea. And the Red Sea opened up like two mountains and a valley between. And so you can walk through as on dry ground, as if it was normal dry ground. As if we were walking on the pavement. As if we were walking on this ground. It's amazing. It's nothing short of a miracle. And it took faith for the children of Israel to pass through on dry ground. Did any of the children of Israel, as they were passing through, and as they saw the waves standing up like a wall on their left hand and on their right, did they ever think, as they were in the middle of the Red Sea, what would happen if this was not to be a wall and it was to go back? We would be gone, wouldn't we? This sea was to come over us. It took faith to pass through the Red Sea and to keep going on that dry ground, faith in God that he wouldn't close it back up again until the last person had got on the other side of the road. You know what it takes for the provisions of God? It takes us to receive them. We've got to take them by faith. We've got to take the gospel by faith. We've got to take the provisions of God by faith. When when we cry out to him and our backs are against the wall as they often are and we say, Lord, help. And he sends us a provision. We've got to go through it. What person would see an escape door when there's a fire and not go through it? You've got to go through it. You see, sometimes some people, they're convinced the gospel is true. They're convinced that Jesus died on a cross. They're convinced they're sinners. They're convinced of it. But you know what the problem is? They never go through the door. They never get saved. They never trust Christ. Is that you? Absolutely convinced. There are a lot of people that go to hell, friends, that are convinced the gospel is true. But they never take it. What would the children of Israel do if the Red Sea was opened up and said, no, I'm not going through? What happens if those waters come back again? People have a million and one excuses about why they don't trust Christ. Just take him. Take him at his word. Believe in him. And as believers, we've got to take the Lord at his word when he provides for us that way of escape. That's what the perspective is from the Israelites, faith. Now, secondly, more briefly, we'll see it from the other angle as we turn the diamond around and as we look at it from another facet and we see it for the Egyptians' point of view, very, very different because it says, Hebrews 11.29b, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. They were held off by the pillar of fire And then when it went and they saw the Red Sea that was opened, they went after. Now, when the plague started happening, there should have been alarm bells for Pharaoh, shouldn't it? Should have been alarm bells for him. Just like in the Second World War. Do you know that they stopped ringing the bells for normal services? Did you know that? And they said, well, you're to ring the bells when there's an invasion. 
And it would be, it was, it was right. They would have the local defence volunteers and the home guard, and they were a little bit like Dad's army. <laughs> and and that's what they would do to, to signal the invasion. When there were paratroopers that would go in, they would ring the bells, the alarm bells. So when people heard the church bells in in the Second World War, they would know there's an invasion. And these should have been these alarm bells that should have been ringing for Pharaoh. Problems, problems. But he didn't, he ignored them. He carried on in his way. He hardened his heart more and more and more. Even when he let them go, even when his nation is obliterated, even when his firstborn son is dead, he still chases after the Israelites. How hard the human heart is, isn't it? How hard the human heart is. It's what it does. They're hardened to the things of God. Today, if we will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. And this is interesting, that the one source that meant life to one meant death to another. The one thing, the very one thing that was the source of deliverance was actually the source of condemnation. It's just like a football match, isn't it? You know, you get or a sporting match, and, and at the end, when there's not a draw, you see that there's one match, and yet there's such a mixture, isn't there, of emotions. For the team, there's one. Oh, there's jubilation. There's celebration. We've won it. Wow, this is incredible. And then you look at the other team, and you look at the other fans, and what happens? There's a complete contrast, isn't there? There's dejection. This one same source. You know, it says in the Bible that we are an aroma for some, for life leading to life, and for death unto death. The same gospel, you know, some can listen to it and it can be music to their ears. It can be joyful. They can't get enough of it. They love the Lord Jesus being preached. And for others, huh, oh, I don't like this. You know, they rubbish this. And they harden their heart. Are you like that? Hardening your heart. I'm not having this for the Lord. Do you do that? We shouldn't do, should we? We should be softened to the things of God. And trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as he's offered in the gospel is the means of gospel preaching, hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and saying, no. Friends, there comes a point where the Lord says, I'll deliver you over then. There's a gospel hardening. You can't just keep on hearing it and not responding it and think we'll be all right. Friends, no, there's a, there is an urgency, isn't there? We've got to trust in Christ while we can and believe in him. This, this, this controversy, you see, between the Israelites and the Egyptians, it would be over. And one day there'll be this controversy that'll be over that's happening and raging between the church and the forces of darkness. And the church, even though it looks so small, will be delivered and finally gone. And Satan and his cohorts will be gone. Just as the Egyptians were drowned. Why did it happen? Because the Lord was in control. How can you read Exodus 14 and not think about the Lord? Who opened the Red Sea? The Lord. Who called Moses to, to stretch out his hand when every one of them was safe on the other side of the shore? And he said, right, and stretch out his hand and put that water back again. It was the Lord. You see, the Israelites were not saved because of who they were. They didn't stand a chance. It was men v. boys. They were untrained. They didn't have any weapons. They, could have, they would have been outsmarted. They would have been outfought. They would have run rings round Israel, the Egyptians. Why did they win that day? It wasn't because of how good they were. It wasn't because of how clever they were. You know why they won? Because the Lord was fighting for them. And you know how, why we're saved this morning if you're trusting in Christ? It's not because you're cleverer than your next door neighbour who couldn't care tuppence about Jesus. Absolutely not. They might be cleverer than you. It's because of the Lord. And why is it that he's kept us? It's because of the Lord. And why is it that he's with us? Why haven't we bombed out years ago? Why is it that some of you, as I see you, you've worked with the Lord for many, many years, decades, and you keep going, and you keep going, and you've had fierce trials, and you've kept going, and you've kept going. Is it because you've got a more stiff upper lip than the next person? No, it's because of the Lord. It's because the Lord has kept us going. It's because the Lord has fought for us. And who was it that drowned the Egyptians? It was the Lord. It's the Lord. And we've got to focus on the Lord. On the wonder of God. You remember Psalm 124. It says, if, if the Lord had not been on our side, let Israel now say, 
if the Lord had not been on our side, when men rose up against us, they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Isn't that a commentary on Exodus 14? And isn't that a commentary on your life? As it is in mine? I can honestly tell you that if it hadn't been for the Lord, not only would I not be a minister, I wouldn't be a believer and I wouldn't keep going. And it's the Lord who's kept us going. And it's not because of strategies and it's not because of cleverness and it's not because of anything else but the Lord. It's Him, isn't it true? And couldn't you say the same thing on the testimony of your life? You have to get up on the witness stand of your life. Can't you testify? It's not me. It's not what I've done. It's not how good I am. It's the Lord's goodness. And it's the Lord's grace. And it's the Lord who saves. And it's the Lord who condemns. It's the Lord. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, it really sums up our verse in Hebrews 11. It says this, Consider the goodness and severity of God. You see, sometimes the problem is we can try and fly with one wing in the aeroplane. We can, we can go with one oar. And some people, they love the goodness of God. Well, that's wonderful. We too love the goodness of God. God is very good. He's very kind. He's very gracious. He's very merciful. But we can do that at the expense of forgetting that God is severe. We like the idea about the Israelites being saved. But hang on a minute. We're not going to really think about the Lord drowning the Egyptians too much or, or God's justice. Or, or We're not really going to do that. Do you know that's what leads people to deny central truths of the Christian gospel? It's grieving. Godly people have denied, better people than us have denied central truths of the gospel, friends. And they say, no, there's no such thing as eternal punishment. Why? Because they're focusing too much on the goodness of God and not balancing it with the severity of God. There is a just God. Otherwise, why did Jesus go to the cross and suffer the things he suffered? If there's no such thing as a just God, we've got to consider the severity of God. He says both. Consider, which is the word we often use for behold, Behold the goodness and severity of God. And there's some people, they go down the other line and they're severe, they love the justice of God and they, they love all of that, but they don't love the goodness of God and they become cold and austere and don't come warm. Now don't do that. You need both of us. We're to think about the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. The Lord was good to the Israelites and he's good to us. But there's both. The goodness and severity of God, isn't there? This is what the Lord has done. And how it is awful thing to trifle with the living God. Don't trifle with him. Don't muck him about. Don't do a pharaoh. These things are written before and for our learning. We're to be those who trust in God. Not fighting against him. Not putting up those weapons. Not hardening our hearts. Saying, Lord, I want to obey you. And to trust in him and put up the white flag of surrender because this shows the wonderful works of God. They'll be talking about this event again and again. Do you know, it doesn't just talk about it here in Hebrews 11 and in Exodus 14. It talks about it in Isaiah, it talks about it in the Psalms, it talks about it in many, many places. This Red Sea event, this wondrous event, it's incredible, isn't it? The Lord opening up when it seemed up for the children of Israel, the Lord opening it up for. And hasn't the Lord done wonders? One generation shall praise your works to another. Oh, that men would give thanks to God for all his goodness and for all his works among the children of men. Oh, that we praise God. What's the tragedy of people who don't love God? The tragedy is that the Lord's name is not honoured, isn't it? The tragedy is that, that he's not being glorified. The tragedy is people are not thinking about his works. The tragedy is they're trying to argue it away by science and other things and throw God out of the equation of their lives. That's the tragedy, isn't it? That God's not getting the glory he deserves. That's the, that's the awful thing. 
And it's the goodness of God that causes us to turn to him and love him and submit to him and delight in him and the wonders that he's done, especially in sending his son to die on the cross for sinners and to come to him by faith. You see, after this event happened, they sung a song to praise the Lord. They didn't just get on with life. It was good. When we have the Lord's deliverances, we don't just get on with life and forget the things God's done for us. We're to praise him. That's what they did. They're on the, the shore on the other side. They praise God. They had this wonderful song, this song of Moses and of the Lamb, as we're told. And what's one of the verses that they say about the wonderful things that God has done in Exodus 15 and verse 11? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? Glorious in holiness. Fearful in praises. Doing wonders. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a great, great God. And we bow to you. You are the same God who opened up the Red Sea all those years ago. And we praise you. Lord, we thank you that you know how to deliver the godly. You are great and you are glorious. Oh, may we not be those like Pharaoh who harden our hearts to you and become so occupied with ourselves. But Lord, may we trust and submit to you. Be with us. We pray that we would truly know the greatness and the grandeur of you. It is you, Lord, who fight for us. It is you who do the work. May we once again entrust ourselves to you and to praise you for all of your goodness and all of your works among the children of men to say you are a great, great God and you've done great things and you're greatly to be praised. May we worship you. May we put the emphasis on you because you are worth it in every way. May we submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our last hymn, 137, to God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in, 137. <laughs> To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes the moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, 
and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be a wonder of rapture when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.